today I'm going to show you how I made this very cool birdhouse with sticks and twigs and an etching on the face. I'll go into the details and my mistakes and how I recover from those mistakes and hopefully teach you how to make your own birdhouse. I'm going to go over how I made these uh, faces. They're all done with etching. This is the plywood I used. It's 12 by 12. So obviously the cost of plywood is going to be relevant or any wood you decide to use if you're going to make one of these. So I used the Diwali laser engraver that I have. I designed it in a program called Lightburn. Now I designed several of them, which you'll see several final pieces once I get past all of this design element. This is the Diwali. It's actually making the um, etchings. And now I'm cutting off the edges, which I also included in the Diwali, so I knew exactly where to cut. I'm just sanding down the edges so they're smooth. Probably didn't need to do that. Now I'm putting the holes. They're about inch and a quarter inch and an eighth, something like that, which is a typical size for a birdhouse. And I'm just putting those down. Now this is plywood, so I do seal it at the end because outside plywood's not the greatest, but everything is sealed when I when I do these birdhouses, so they're not gonna fall apart on you outside. But it's your obligation to reseal things, and I suggest once a year, clean your birdhouse out, put it inside after you seal it, let it sit there and dry so uh, there won't be any chemical smell on it. But what I did with these is I also colorized them. So each one is unique, one of a kind, and I wanted to use um, water-based colors, but I ended up using an alcohol-based ink. These are alcohol-based ink pens, and I got them at Walmart. They were pretty inexpensive, I think 10 bucks or something like that for several, maybe six or seven choices. And there's also a blending pen in there so it was kind of nice anyway I'm just giving it a little bit more pop and interest I don't know if people are gonna like these you know everything's a, a risk a, a guess when you're creating but that's part of the creative process you're making things that you hope are interesting to people and that they will want to purchase these I mean it's fun to make these birdhouses but who wants to sit on 50 100 birdhouses for you know for fun okay you can give them away but after a while people are like uncle with the birdhouses or anything you make so I make them to try to sell so I'm trying these new ideas and hoping that this isn't too cheeky and that people will like them here are the finals with the colorizing on them This is the one that I used for the twig birdhouse that I'm making now. So now I'm going to go into the details of how I built this birdhouse. And I first put a frame. I made a frame. I'm lining up exactly the right angle to the top of the birdhouse so the frame sits in there nicely. And I just took a um, three-quarter inch, three-quarter inch post that I made from a pine board that started out at three-quarter inch and I ripped it on my bandsaw to match the three-quarter inch thickness of the board. And I'm just cutting up the pieces to make the, the uh, frame so I've got something to attach those twigs to.
once I got the framing all done, I just put this little thing in here. It's like a ridge line and um, just to give some more support for the roof that I'm going to be putting on here. And now it's time for the twigs. What I'm using here was uh, apple twigs. I have an apple tree on my property at the cabin and I'm just cutting and it was a tad tricky with that cutter but I didn't have a bandsaw or, or a scroll saw with me at the cabin so what I did was I used that hand cutter which worked out fine. So I started thick at the bottom, thicker pieces and then I decided it it really didn't matter. It was going to be random anyway, which I thought would be more interesting. Um, not controlled, not contrived. So I just ended up going with whatever fit next to the previous uh, stick. And uh, sometimes I use some fillers. Other times I just let it be airy. I didn't think it mattered. Um, anyway, that's how I went with it. And that's this process. So here I am going to fill a couple of those big gaps with some other sticks. Probably wasn't necessary, but I just, I don't know why I did it. I just did it. So I did obviously do it in some places. Put a little twig on the front. I thought that would be cool. Possibly a place for the bird to stand on as it uh, guards its house. Um, don't ask me what kind of bird is on top of the roof because I don't know. Now for the bottom of this birdhouse that I will be drilling holes in and screwing into that framework I made previously so people can get in and remove the debris after a year to clean out the birdhouse. Now, a lot of people don't do that. I, you know, I suppose you don't have to. I've had birdhouses around my house and never done that, and it's never seemed to be a deterrent for the bird to return. Nevertheless, that option is available. Now, this piece of wood is wormy chestnut, and I had to condition it a little bit, which is fine. It's rustic, and I I like that and, and most of the things that I do I like that so what I'm using here is an 80 grit sandpaper it's a disc a flap disc on an angle grinder and I'm just sanding down the edges and I don't want to not make it rustic I, I like that so I've had to fill in a few holes I did that and then I stained those holes uh, I don't know if I recorded that or not that's the filler right there but a sustainable filler. In any event, I just wanted to secure it as much as possible. And you can see some of the holes from the uh, dead worms from the uh, blight. Now some of this wormy chestnut I've got is over a hundred years old. So it's a, it's a pretty cool piece of wood. And anyway, it is the bottom.
So now I'm just doing a little dressing up for the front. I was thinking about putting a post there for the bird. Also, if that sticks out too far, that's a recipe to get knocked off. So I'm very careful not to make it stick out too far. Although it looks like I did do that. Yeah, you see, I saw that right there and I decided to cut it back. So I went over to the scroll saw, which I did offline, and I did cut it back so it wouldn't stick out so far and risk getting knocked off. I also took it over to my belt sander and sanded it flat so I had a greater surface for the glue to stick to. I know I've mentioned in the past how hot this glue is. And you can turn it down with this particular gun, but it's nothing like viscosity, a high viscosity to work and manipulate the glue. But I was very fortunate in this blessed, I'll say, in this particular birdhouse, I didn't get any on me, so I didn't burn myself. That's a good thing. That glue gun right there, it's a sure bonder. I got that from the same website, same company that I bought the glue sticks from. If you're interested, you can find it at the same place. I'm sure you know as potential woodworkers, maybe you don't know because you're a potential woodworker, but those of you who are woodworkers know there's so many different kinds of glues you can use from CA glue with an accelerator to wood glue and each one you know takes a different amount of time the CA glue with the accelerator is quite fast but it doesn't uh, warrant use every time you're looking to glue something so you know, once you experience this, and I, I can share with you that there are different glues for different projects, and you'll have to find out, based on your particular project, which one works best for you. As for the hot glue I use, there are two drawbacks. The heat is uh, a drawback, because if you get burned with a 400 degree glue that sticks to you, well, that's not fun. And the other potential thing is all the stringy stuff that's left over but you know that's part of the the problem with it or whatever it, it works good so I stick with it Now that I've got everything in place and all the twigs, I think I ended up cutting off some of those extended pieces. That's just a recipe to get ripped off. Cool as it is, uh, when I pack these things up for uh, festivals, <laughs> that stuff definitely will get broken, which I want to avoid. I'm also picking off all those stringy pieces. I don't know if you can see that detail. So I'm measuring the width, and it was about 10 inches, I think, by about 7 I did have a little eave on the birdhouse. And I used sticks again for what they call purlins. They go across that 10-inch uh, width. And yes, I'm using quarter-inch plywood, which some may think isn't durable enough for outside, but I did seal it before I put a copper hammered piece of copper on top of it. So I feel pretty confident that it's going to last. And let's face it, it is wood. It's all wood. And wood just doesn't hold up outside. I mean, the weather, the rain, the wind, it's, it's very destructive. It's destructive on our houses, which is why we end up doing vinyl and and whatever else to try to protect our homes from nature. But that's just the way it is, and this birdhouse isn't any different. That is one of the reasons I suggest people really taking care of their birdhouses, bringing them inside every year, cleaning them up, 
doing any repairs if need be. Anybody who watches my videos can say, oh, well, I better get some glue or whatever to fix this or fix that and, you know, take and repair things like like anything that's outside. It needs to be maintained. And now I'm adding some rustic limb pieces of molding to uh, just, well, fill in some holes and cracks. But, but more than that, just to add to the uh, overall organic look of this piece, of this birdhouse. Of course, all of these little embellishments take time, and but they add to the details in a way that a lot of traditional birdhouses don't. And that's what separates these from a traditional birdhouse, which is what I suggest you all try, just to make something that's unique and different. And, you know, maybe some of you are, which is great. Uh, add it in the comments below and let other people check out what you do if you do have a YouTube channel. Not all of you do have YouTube channels, but if you do, then um, you can you know share it with others and I'm fine with that so what I'm doing now is just staining the underside because that light color just I don't think it'll look good and I do like the contrast of this dark walnut stain which I obviously apply with a brush it would have been way too much stain to do with the stain pen so I did it with a brush and um, a can of liquid stain and I could get into these little cracks and areas that I probably couldn't get into otherwise. So now I'm working on this copper roof and this is 36 gauge copper and I'm kind of just hammering it out. Nothing special about this. It's meant to be rustic and organic again. So what I'm going to do is size it up. Again, it was 10 inches by 7 inches. But what I want to do is turn over the edges so the buyer doesn't get cut with this particular copper. So now I'm going to put several coats of polyurethane. Keep in mind, I've already sealed the face of this birdhouse after I, before I colorized it, and even after I, after I colorized it, I sealed it. But I put several coats of this polyurethane on here. It's an exterior polyurethane. It's both, but it worked really well to seal the birdhouse. And I have this turntable that I use. It's small, so it's lightweight, and I put the birdhouse on that, and I put it in my photo box and took these pictures. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.